Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode here from Quiglet. Thank you as always for all of your support and kind words. I'm happy to say that I am now back with a new video for any A-level English literature students. Today I'll be comparing the Great Gatsby and the pre-1900 section of the AQA English Literature A Poetry Anthology, as is a request from one of my very kind subscribers. So, as always, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to share it with anybody in your class or anybody in particular. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to see more updates. And if you haven't already, Quiglet can be found across all these different social media platforms you see here. So, as always, what can you do with this video? Don't forget you can take notes and ask a question in the comments. Please, I always get back to them. That is the Quiglet guarantee. I make sure to always reply to your very kind suggestions and comments. In addition, use this as a revision tool. Watch it back with your class, watch it back with classmates, or watch it back by yourself as a process of independent learning and study. Use this as well to help make mind maps. We're gonna be looking at a lot of joined up ideas today, a lot of comparisons, which are really, really useful. And lastly, use it to help list examples. Use it as a revision tool to help keep boosting those skills of understanding, two of the core texts for the A-level English Literature course. So, some key details you need to know before we begin. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today relates principally to section C of the Love Through the Ages examination paper. In this, you have a choice of two questions, and what I'll be showing you later are the previous questions that the exam board have provided now, the hinge in all of these is this phrase that you must write about at least two poems in your answer, as well as the prose text you have studied. So to break that down, you need to be commenting on or analysing two poems. And don't worry about doing more. I wouldn't recommend that personally. It's better to have a more in-depth and thorough analysis of two poems than it is for a more broader, sort of slimmed down analysis of three and the prose text, which in this case, uh, for the purposes of this video, I'll be looking at The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So, as you see here, probably worth taking a pause at this point, these are the past questions on the examination board from AQA since June 2018. And one thing I'd like to just point out about the two separate choices is you often have either a, a specific what I'd refer to as sometimes a theme or a kind of uh, use of a kind of device or a technique, We're largely thematic, so for example, the loss of love, endings, time, or they provide you with a quotation. So you'll see here where there's quotes on pain, quotes on separation, quotes on women and men. However, what I've tried to do to make this a little bit easier for you folks, not only would I recommend you using these as practice questions, but I'd also recommend you just using the words in bold as a method of independent learning. So look at women and men in Gatsby and two poems. Look at separation in Gatsby and two poems of your choice. From there, you'd have a really good way into practicing for these exams. So it's all well and good knowing the questions, but what do you need to do to get the top marks? Now, the marks are awarded on what we call as teachers and an examination body that is AQA call assessment objectives. They're also known as AOs. Now, every question is out of 25 marks and those 25 marks aren't equally proportioned across all the five assessment objectives. But what you need to do is have an understanding of what each one entails. So, for example, assessment objective one looks at this idea of an informed, personal, creative response to literary texts. It looks at the idea of concepts, terminology, and but also a coherent, accurate written expression. I like to tell my class or refer to it to my class as AO1 being the beating heart of what you do in terms of an examination, how it's your written response. It is effectively how you're crafting your essay. Assessment objective two is analysis, this idea of ways meanings are shaped in literary texts. So you're analysing the way a meaning can be shaped, and that can be in many different ways, but you need that sense of analysis. Assessment objective three is looking at this idea of contexts. 
significance and influence of context in which literary texts are written. So be quite mindful of that. But one big warning I would offer is AO3 is not a history lesson. Some of the weaker responses that I've come across in my career are ones that often really go heavy on assessment objective three. And there really is no need. What you want to actually do is be mindful of context. And context can be historical. Context can be within the setting itself, you know, where a writer chooses to locate a specific scene. Uh, but it should inform the essay. It shouldn't be the essay itself. AO4 is a connections across literary texts where you find any connections. And this section C question is quite rich in that. So you shouldn't have any problems finding those. And the last point is different interpretations. Now, I have a lot of students come across this idea that you have to have some sort of uh, for example, a Marxist critique or a feminist critique or a post-colonial critique. It really isn't that. Different interpretation is just as you read it. It is a different interpretation in the same way any two readers may have different interpretations. It just comes down to that. But largely, while all five have to be present, I tend to give a slight preference to them in numerical order. By that, I mean AO1 is, is the beating heart of it. Without that, there's nothing. So really focus on what AO1 will look like and how that will be manifested in your examination. So the mark bands are here, and they are also in five mark bands. Out of 25, and the mark band descriptors that AQA provide give you the kind of points here. They refer to any piece within... They refer to any piece within the exam as being perceptive and assured. That's your top bands. If someone can provide an assured response, that they really know the text, they're really able to analyse and comment upon them, then that's really successful. Um, going all the way down to band one, um, you're really not answering the question if you're at band one. I mean, it's, it's quite simple as that. So there we are. There are the bands. They roughly correlate to certain grades, but they do change slightly with every year. Now, the examiner's report. I provided the examiner's report for June 2019, as this was the last year before the COVID pandemic. So this is the last sort of pre-COVID uh, exam. There's no advanced information, and this is how exams going forward will be looking. So what did the examiners say the best students do in this question? So. First of all, they make a point of saying that response may not be equally balanced between the two texts. By that, it means you may not write a third on Gatsby, a third on one poem, and a third on another poem. And that's not a problem. They acknowledge that can be the case. So long as you're accessing them, that's important. In addition, compare how, followed by a focus on an aspect of presentation, is going to be the question. Whatever the question is going to be, that is the structure. That is the kind of spine of the piece. So you're going to compare how something happens, followed by a focus on an aspect of presentation. And if you're to go back to the former slide that I showed you with all the questions, you'll see that every question boils down to that essential framework. In addition, avoid too much exposition and narrative. I think this is really crucial. Uh, so I said earlier about the fact that you don't need to give us a history lesson. But equally, you don't want to give us a summary of the book. That's not what it's about. And often the weakest responses betray themselves by doing that. I can tell a weak response if it's telling me the story because you're clinging to the most to almost superficial points in analysis. You can't provide any analysis from it. So be careful. The most effective responses, as they say here, are selective, they're succinct and very specifically focused. Look at that precision, succinct, specific. A good response is always about that. It sticks to the core points of what a text is trying to argue and what a text is trying to say, but through the lens of the question itself and the demands of the question. So that's really, really crucial. Also, the success of an answer depends on the choices made. Now, I'll show you the list of all the poems from the anthology, and some are very, very much better equipped or much better linked to certain um, questions than others are. And some certainly some of these poems are better linked to Gatsby than others are. And lastly, perhaps most crucial choice was which poems to include. Kind of alludes to what I've just mentioned there. You have to be careful on what poems you're picking. 
Now, I've provided my own. I'm going to go through roughly a third of the anthology in a bit and talk you through why I think these poems are particularly strong. That doesn't necessarily mean there aren't others, but there are certain ones that are worth avoiding for any question. So just be very mindful of that. Be careful of the choices you're making because that hinges on what you do for the rest of the piece. So as you see here, here are the love poetry through the ages pre-1900 selection, of which you have over a dozen. Now today I'm going to focus on five specific poems that personally I find have quite a close link to The Great Gatsby. That doesn't mean there aren't others, and if you feel there are others, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. However, today I'll be focusing on these five specific poems you see here. And with each one, I will compare them to The Great Gatsby on aspects of love, as well as their similarities and differences on their portrayal of specific aspects of love. So let's begin. Firstly, I'll begin with The Great Gatsby compared to Whoso List to Hunt, I Know Where is a Hind by Sir Thomas Wyatt. Now, in here, both texts demonstrate a sense of an unattainable love. In Wyatt's poem, we obviously have this sense of not being able to ever achieve the love they yearn for, in many of the same ways that the great Gatsby has between the titular character of Gatsby and Daisy. For example, in Wyatt's poem, he talks about how the object of his affections is graven with diamonds for Caesar's I am. This idea of diamonds being something exquisite and something exorbitant to go and sort of strive for, in much the same way that Gatsby values Daisy on a material level. However, we've got this idea that Daisy also mentions in chapter seven to Gatsby, if you want too much, this thing that he can never have, in the same way that Wyatt's narrative voice can never have the object of his affections. It's always out of both narrative voices and characters' grasps. However, Wyatt's narrative is one of resignation. In Wyatt's narrative, there is a, a, a kind of almost giving up that this object of their affections can never be theirs, and they have almost accepted that. And this contrast with Gatsby's what I call quixotic determination, this idea of a kind of almost uh, beyond reason and beyond rationality, uh, this desire of his to attain Daisy in a way that she can never be attained anymore. For example, in Wyatt's poem, it mentions as for me, alas, I may no more, and the vain travail and wearied mind. There's this sense that Wyatt is coming to peace, or Wyatt's narrative voice rather is coming to peace and accepting what they cannot change. Whereas in The Great Gatsby, we have these two quotes, both from Gatsby, that my life has got to keep going up, and Carraway saying he did not know that it was already behind him. The sense of being doomed, but our character in Gatsby not being able to see that sense of doom in his object of his love. Now the second poem I'd like to look at is The Garden of Love by William Blake and how that compares to The Great Gatsby. Now in some regards both the both texts present a loss of love from a time of innocence to a present of hard experiences. So both voices come out of this in a way that hardens them or damages them beyond repair. For example, Blake comments on how he used to play on the green, this past tense of used to play, giving this sense of a kind of idyllic past of a childhood, of a love uh, seen through the green as well, this element of a natural imagery. We see this also in Jordan's description of the officer, Gatsby, who looked at Daisy in a way that every young girl wants to be looked at. So both elements of love, be it in Blake's poem or Fitzgerald's novel, are forged from a past. They're forged from a past where our narrative perspective is not there anymore. And it's important for them to kind of see that connection between the two. Uh, Blake also goes on to mention about how tombstones where flowers should be in this garden of love, this idea of death and this idea of death destroying the love. We've got this idea of the East being haunted haunted for Nick Carraway uh, after Gatsby's death as referenced in the funeral in the final chapter of the novella. So we get in both this idea of the consequences of love leave this sense of death, this element of haunting, this element of a, a kind of lingering melancholy. However, Blake's mourning a love in a religious and pastoral sense, whereas Gatsby's is centred around Daisy and to a degree this image of wealth. Remember, Gatsby, while he is in love with Daisy, we don't know to what extent he's in love with the image of Daisy as compared to the person that is Daisy Buchanan. 
For example, in Blake's poem, it describes priests in black gowns and how they're binding with briars, my joys and desires. This idea of an oppression by organised religion, how his love once shown through his love of religion in its purest most direct and personal sense but also the pastoral imagery being destroyed by this um chapel that's built in the midst but also the pursuit of love for both is hindered however for blake as i mentioned just there it's by organized religion organized religion is the object that is the kind of antagonistic force in his love for gatsby it's social status and old money so we see this idea as i mentioned before blake describes how a chapel was built in the midst and Tom Buchanan describes Gatsby as Mr. Nobody from nowhere, how for both of them, they have these greater forces at play that will destroy or um, hinder their love, which is not seen in um, the same way in both texts. So our third poem of my choice here is At an Inn by Thomas Hardy, and I'd like to show you how you can compare The Great Gatsby to this text. So, in both texts, they demonstrate love to be inconsistent, how at one point it's there and present and very real, but the other, it isn't. Both texts also explore the notion of unrequited love. For example, the narrator in At an Inn, as well as George um, Wilson, and to some extent Gatsby himself. Um, how George is desperately in love with Myrtle, but it's not responded to in kind. In the same way, Gatsby loves Daisy in a way that she cannot love him back. Both texts also bear contextual links. So we know, for example, that Thomas Hardy was inspired by his uh, connection, his, for want of a better term, relationship with Florence Henniker, which was never consummated or realised to his full desire. Whilst Gatsby's pursuit of Daisy mirrors the biographical pursuit of Zelda Sayre by F. Scott Fitzgerald, there's a lot of parallels there between not only the two texts, but the two authors of the two texts. However, at an inn is a relationship that is never once physically realised or materialised in any sense. And there's a sense of a lingering regret to that. Whereas Gatsby pines for a time where it was made real. We know for a fact that through the retelling of the narrative and the elements of the past that certain characters provide for us, that Gatsby once had a connection to Daisy that he cannot repeat. Um, for example, in Attenin, it says, yet never, never, look how definitive that tone is, the love light shone between us there. Whereas Gatsby kissed her curious and lovely mouth in chapter eight, this sense of being with her on a physical, intimate level that uh, does not happen in Attenin. Also, Attenin portrays two figures as mutual lovers, that the sense that they both have a shared desire on a similar level. Whereas love is almost always one sided in The Great Gatsby. You know, Myrtle loves Tom Buchanan for not for the reasons that Tom Buchanan likes Myrtle. Tom Buchanan doesn't have a relationship with Daisy. Daisy doesn't have the relationship with Gatsby that Gatsby desires from her. And there's all these different contrasts. So notice how in Attenin it says, now we seem not we, not what we aching are. These pronouns of we that we're together, this, this connection, this sense between the two of them. Whereas in The Great Gatsby, it describes how Gatsby committed himself to the following of a grail, almost like a holy connotations, a significant biblical proportions behind Daisy. Now, the grail itself could arguably be Daisy, but it also could be this idea of wealth and status that Daisy personifies. So be mindful of that as you analyse it. Now, penultimately, I want to consider the poem La Belle Dame Sans Merci by John Keats and how this poem connects to F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel. So, both texts here explore love as devastating, have a devastation and a haunting effect to them, how the love is not only not fully realised, but it leaves their characters in a very specific light. For example, in La Belle Dame, it describes, describes how uh, our knight, our chivalric character, is alone and palely loitering. And we see how George Wilson, particularly at the end of the novella, is describing how he's been sick all day, how he is somebody who is, is clearly affected by the lack of love uh, that is felt between himself and Myrtle, particularly as he starts to realise the affair that is occurring behind his back. In addition, both texts present love and rather the figures of love as ethereal, almost beyond human comprehension or describe them in a way that is beyond the human realm. For example, in La Belle Dame, Keats describes how the object of the love and desire is a fairy's child, you know, almost of this um, magical 
elements. Whereas Daisy's voice is a voice that men, quote, found difficult to forget. Her face was sad and lovely, but with bright things in it, bright eyes and a bright, passionate mouth. Notice this bright, difficult to get. There's qualities of Daisy that go beyond the human. In the same way that the qualities of the object of desire in La Belle Dame, the, the woman is someone who is beyond the human imagining. In addition, both texts present characters as unfulfilled and yearning for someone or something. We see this in the quotes here, particularly how a really interesting one I think often goes uh, unmentioned is how Nick described in chapter one how he felt that Tom would drift on forever seeking a little wistfully the dramatic turbulence of some irrecoverable football game. Whereas there's one slight difference here. In Keats's imagery of love and desire, they're firmly rooted in this uh, world of medieval imagery and the magical, the elfin grot, for example, whereas Fitzgerald's love interest are in some cases more rooted in a kind of earthy reality of the time and the context. For example, Myrtle, her, her sense of love and her sense of desire and what Tom desires of her is, is, is very human, very real in that regard. And lastly, the final poem I want to compare The Great Gatsby to is Non Sum Qualis Erum Bonae Sub Regno Sinera, or Sonara by Ernest Dowson. Now, uh, these two texts both present love as having a permanently altering state on one's mind. We see the narrative voice in Dowson being in this way, this repetition of I have been faithful to the Sonara in my fashion, the last line of each stanza, I was almost transfixed and hooked on this Sinera figure, Sinara figure. And we also see how what preyed on Gatsby, you know, this desire almost preys on Gatsby, that it's a destructive force on him. But he knew that when he kissed this girl, Daisy, and forever wed his unutterable visions to her perishable breath, this, this idea of his first kiss with Daisy being something that transfixes him, but also transforms him in a permanent sense. However, we have to consider a few differences here, and a comparison is both. Don't forget that. A comparison doesn't have to be a similarity. Dowson's narrative voice attempts in vain to change by finding the love of another, while Gatsby attempts to change himself. There's a very different sense of how love affects these two figures. For example, in Non Sum Qualis, describes about how be betwixt her lips and mine there fell thy shadow this idea that he cannot move on despite trying to find other women cannot find a figure that doesn't stop him thinking of this Sinara figure however Jay Gatsby of West Egg Long Island sprang from his platonic conception of himself he changes himself in Gatsby whereas Dowson's narrative voice tries to change by finding another figure of love so there's a slightly different idea there between the two. Also, Dowson's narrative voice see seeks self-destruction through these kind of um, Dionysus, Dionysian um, ideas of mm, uh, wine and drinking, um, whereas Gatsby seeks self-improvement. Gatsby is teetotal, is um, partially a consequence of love. His perception of self-improvement is really important there because there's a kind of unanswered question in Gatsby of to what extent Gatsby is in love with Daisy, as I said before, or in love with the society Daisy inhabits. So, for example, in Dowson's poem, he describes how he cried for madder music and stronger wine, whereas Jordan describes how Gatsby bought that house so Daisy would be just across the bay, this idea of a tantalising image, and his idea of doing that is to improve and build upon himself. However much one can call it improvement, obviously Gatsby has very controversial elements to his... Uh, rise, whereas in Dowson's we clearly see there's this almost nihilistic, destructive aspect to the narrative voice affected by the love that the character, the narrative voice, feels. So thank you as always for tuning in. I really appreciate it. It's been a while, but it's been really good to be back. I hope that's been useful to you. Please like the video. Don't forget to share it and subscribe. And as always, the three social media platforms you see there, Twitter, Instagram and TikTok Wiggly is also available on. But until next time, take care, all the very best and bye bye.